stay true to yourself, and always be a man of value. Unfortunately, there's been a change of plans. Honey, the merger meeting has been moved up, and I have to leave tomorrow morning and won't be back until late Sunday. I understand how important this wedding is, especially since you're the maid of honor, but I just got promoted to CFO and missing this meeting is not an option for the company or our future. I'm really sorry. Are you serious? We've been planning this for so long, and now you cancel at the last minute. I'm going alone. Do you realize how embarrassing this is going to be for me? Can't someone else go instead? Vera, this deal is worth over $2 billion, and I'm leading it. We've been working hard on it for the past year, and there's no one else who can take my place. A lot of people's jobs depend on our success. I know it's tough, and I'm going to make it up to you with the bonus we get from this deal. I understand you're upset, but there's nothing I can do about it. I'll be back on Sunday. Needless to say, she was furious. She stopped talking to me and told me to sleep in the guest room. No intimacy or sex before my trip. This wasn't normal. Her coldness and anger were not like her. I tried to understand, but I couldn't ease her anger, so I packed for my trip and spent the night in the guest room. I knew the wedding meant a lot to her because of her friend Carol's struggles. Carol's ex-husband cheated on her during her life-threatening illness and left her because he couldn't handle her slow recovery. This devastated Carol and made her situation worse. But after a miraculous recovery, Carol filed for divorce on the grounds of abandonment and battled depression for the next five years. All of her friends and family were there for her, trying to lift her spirits, but nothing seemed to work. Then one day she met a man in the grocery store, and suddenly her world brightened and she returned to her old self. The prayers of her friends and family were answered, and everyone wanted to celebrate the joyous occasion. Brandon, her fiancé, adored her and organized a magnificent wedding. Vera, her closest friend and maid of honor, was by her side throughout. I knew how important this was to Vera and regretted having to cancel, but I was helpless. I knew I had to make it up to her and bear her wrath. Before I left for my trip the next morning, I tried to kiss Vera goodbye, but our bedroom door was locked and she wouldn't open it. I told her I loved her and promised to call her when I landed in Germany. Sadly, I walked to the waiting limousine to take me to the airport. I felt terrible and unhappy about her reaction. Not understanding my predicament after 19 years of marriage, I expected more understanding and compassion. I called her before my flight, but her phone went to voicemail. I left another apology message, hoping for a response. I sent a text before takeoff and another when I landed 10 hours later, but received no reply. I knew she was upset, and I realized I had to apologize profusely to get back in her good graces with no other options. I contacted our twin daughters at college and explained the situation and asked them to check on their mother and make sure she was okay. I emphasized my concern and the importance of hearing from them to allay my fears. They understood and expressed their love for me. They've always been daddy's girls and I cherish them deeply. When I arrived in Germany and checked into the hotel, I called my CEO for an update, only to learn to my horror that the meeting had been canceled due to a death in the family of the other company's CEO. I immediately contacted the airlines and secured a direct flight to Chicago O'Hare, which was only 30 minutes from the meeting location, since the wedding reception was to begin at 7 p.m. M. I estimated that I could arrive at 9 p.m. and be a supportive husband. I believed this gesture would bring her happiness. After picking up the rental car, the GPS helped me find my way to the reception hall. It was just after 9 p.m. when I got there and the party was in full swing. 
The place was alive with loud music, dancing, and lots of drinks, with many guests clearly having a great time and some having a little too much to drink. I was happy to be there and looking forward to seeing my wife again. With more than 200 people there, it wasn't easy to find Vera at first. So I went to the bar, got myself a double bourbon and started looking around for her. Thinking back to our trip together, I remembered that Vera was five years older than me and had just gone through a divorce. When we first met her former husband, Dr. Clayton Adams, he was a resident at Mercy Hospital. When their marriage ended because he was unfaithful to a nurse from work, Vera had thrown him out, heartbroken over his dishonesty. She had dreamed of a life filled with children and joy, but those dreams were shattered by her ex-husband's infidelity. The divorce hit her hard, both emotionally and financially. Since medical residents don't make much money, the settlement split what little they had. Vera began working as a waitress to pay her bills and faced hard times head on. This experience gave her a deep understanding of what Carol was going through. When Vera and I first met, it was like a storybook romance. I was immediately smitten. Despite her past hurts and sadness, I saw in her a precious treasure. Her beauty initially caught my attention, but it was her kindness and compassion that truly won me over. I supported her through her challenges and helped change her life for the better. Together we spent 19 wonderful years raising our twin daughters with abundant love. Vera appreciated my honest and direct approach to our relationship. We often talked about the importance of loyalty and commitment, which gave her a sense of security. I emphasized my respect for loyalty and my intolerance for infidelity and praised her for having the courage to leave her cheating husband. Her resilience in getting through this difficult time was something I deeply admired. Our marriage was built on trust, loyalty and commitment, values that held us together until the unexpected incident at the wedding. At the age of 44, Vera was still breathtakingly beautiful and I, at five, her junior, was in top shape thanks to my dedication to fitness and running at 39, I felt like I was in the prime of my life. Our intimate relationship was strong and the age difference between us was never a problem. Our twin daughters, Marsha and Carrie, were thriving in college, full of life and excited about their futures. We had a happy, loving family and a marriage that seemed unbreakable. That was until I saw Vera at the wedding, sitting alone with Clayton, her former husband. I knew Clayton was friends with the bride, Carol, but his presence at the wedding, especially without his wife, was something I hadn't expected. Tired from my trip and curious about what I was witnessing, I paused to watch them closely and noticed how friendly they seemed together, despite their history. I decided to stay back for a while to get a better sense of how they were interacting. It wasn't long before I felt my world begin to fall apart. I was about to step in and interrupt their cozy moment when she suddenly stood up, took his hand, and led him to the dance floor. Vera looked incredible in her fitted ivory gown, and I desperately hoped this was nothing more than a dance. Her confidence as they moved together through several slow songs took me by surprise. I nursed my drink. I stayed back to see how things would develop. It was clear that Vera had been drinking because her flirtatious behavior gave her away, which I knew could happen. She'd often become more affectionate and playful with me after a few drinks, which was normal for her. What was not usual or acceptable was her openly kissing another man especially in front of her friends, knowing full well that she was my wife. This act of betrayal made me feel both humiliated and angry. Watching my wife share intimate moments and seeing him boldly touch her inappropriately and exchange kisses with her left me in total shock and on I got really angry and just as I was about to step in and stop it, they moved her back to the table, off to the side and began kissing like they were on their honeymoon. I could clearly see his hands on her breasts, 
and her hand under the table. Just before I went over to them, I realized that my marriage was over because I remembered what my dad used to say. Hey, respect yourselves, boys. Don't put up with being treated badly. So I decided to do something, but I kept my cool. I could have made a big scene, ruined the perfect wedding, stopped her and made sure it didn't go any further. But then I thought, if she's into him, she can have him. She's not mine anymore. Feeling strangely calm, I pulled out my phone, zoomed in, and took a bunch of close-ups and a short video. Then I texted her. Guess what, honey? My meeting got postponed and I'm back early. Looks like you're in good hands tonight. I'm going home. I guess you'll be spending the night with DR. Clayton. Now I know why you've been ignoring my calls and texts. Have fun and cheers to the end of our marriage. I'll be gone by the time you get back tomorrow. I hit send and watched calmly, curious if she'd see the message watching her. I saw her phone light up. She noticed, picked it up and started pressing buttons, obviously looking for the text. Vera sobered up quickly, her face turning serious the moment she saw my message. As soon as I noticed her reaction, I left the party for my car. Ver must have freaked out when she saw me leave, but I was out before she could catch up. As I got into my car, I heard her scream. I just gave her a cold look, shook my head, got in my car and drove off before she could catch up. My phone began to explode with calls, but I was too upset to even think about answering. If she was going back to her ex. It was clear we were over, I mean after she caught them together, we were definitely done. 22 years since I left that cheater, and she runs back to him at the first opportunity. I guess she's got some explaining to do to our family and the kids. Because this mess is on her. My phone keeps filling up with desperate texts. Tony, please come back. I have to explain. I love you. Please come back. Damn it, Tony, it's not what you think. I love you, but after two days of long flights, no calls or texts, her cold attitude and seeing her with Clayton, I had no interest in hearing her out. I was as mad as I could be and wanted nothing to do with her or her excuses. After ignoring 20 calls and texts, I finally stopped and sent a text back saying, forget you. I'm doing great at my job my kids are in college and everything is paid for. I'm free to do what I want. I had enough youth left to start something new. After driving four hours of my seven hour trip back to Nashville, I stopped at a diner to eat and take a quick nap in the car. Before resuming my journey home, while enjoying my eggs and bacon, I decided to express my feelings to the world. At the time, Facebook was the go-to social media platform where everyone shared updates about their lives. Between bites, I changed my Facebook status from happily married to single and available. Then I uploaded two photos I had taken of Vera and Clayton sharing a passionate kiss at the wedding. His hand was clearly on her breast. Below the photo, I wrote that Vera was moving on and reuniting with her ex-husband while I was back on the dating scene. It may have been immature, but it was the truth for me. I was moving on without her. The funny thing is Clayton. Her ex was almost 50, balding, overweight, and honestly not an upgrade in any way. It's a mystery why she left us for an old guy who'd already cheated on her. Maybe she preferred a doctor to an accountant. Honestly, it hurt. It hurt a lot. I felt more pain than I could ever remember. I felt sad and angry. But it also seemed absurd. She's ending a 19-year marriage for an old guy who cheated on her over 20 years ago. Forget her and forget him. They're perfect for each other. I'm not the type to tolerate that kind of disrespect. Some might say it was just a kiss and some touching not worth leaving her over. Well, in my book, 
my woman is either committed to me or she's free to be with someone else. We all make our own choices. After my late breakfast and a two-hour nap in the car, I hit the road again and pulled into my driveway at 7 a.m. When I turned on my phone, it started ringing with dozens of notifications, so many that I didn't think it would ever stop. There must have been over a hundred messages from her parents, sister and friends. Within five minutes of turning the phone on, it started ringing and I realized it was Vera. I wondered if she got any sleep last night or if she spent it with Clayton. I just ignored her calls because I was past all the now and just focused on getting what I needed out of the house and moving on. I was on good terms with her family and when they called me that morning, I took the call and explained to her father what had happened. James, I had no idea she was unhappy with our marriage, but cheating was the death knell for our happy life. The disrespect she showed in front of people we know is something I can't tolerate. It's clear that she still has feelings for this jerk, so she can be with him now. I plan to find a woman who values what I bring to the table and will remain faithful. James, I have no other choice. I'm going to move out today and put the house up for sale immediately. Tomorrow morning I'll contact an attorney to start the divorce process. She can stay here until the house sells, and I'll make sure the divorce is fair. Call me old-fashioned, but I won't live with a woman who wants someone else. She made her choice, but I don't think it was wise. James arrived over an hour later and begged me to wait and talk to her before taking any drastic steps. But when he asked me to give her a chance to explain, I again pointed to the photos showing them openly fondling each other at the wedding. I couldn't tolerate that, especially with her ex. Her father was disappointed in her actions and my quick decision. As I walked into our home, I felt tears welling up as I realized that our once happy home was now just a hollow shell of our marriage. Over the past five years, we had transformed our home into our ideal home. At the time, mortgage rates were below 299% and our home value had doubled. As an accountant, I decided to refinance the house at full value, extracting nearly $50,000 in equity. I promptly established $20,000 trusts for each of our daughter's college educations, with a little extra to kickstart their lives. The remaining $10,000 was invested in upgrading the home, making it a place we enjoyed and were proud of. Thanks to the lower interest rate, the monthly payment was only $700 more than before we withdrew the equity. It was a no-brainer and Vera went back to work as a receptionist to cover the extra monthly expenses. My salary was decent, nothing extravagant, but as the newly promoted CFO, I'd receive stock options the following year that would serve as our retirement fund. Vera never cared about our finances as long as her needs were met. She trusted my financial expertise, and she lived comfortably. Although I tried to explain the stock options several times, her lack of interest was obvious, but it didn't bother me much. I was looking forward to our future. Fortunately, this merger, which coincided with the end of my marriage, promised a bonus in stock options of about 4,000 shares. If successful, I would have to wait several years to exercise the options, but the anticipation of the stock reaching $100 per share boosted my confidence in the future. Since the merger was delayed, the options wouldn't be included in the divorce settlement. I plan to file for reconcilable differences and divide our assets, which amounted to about $5,000 in savings. We're splitting the proceeds from the sale of the house, but since it's heavily mortgaged, there wouldn't be much to split. At 44, Fur would leave with her car and $2,000. Had she stayed faithful, she could have enjoyed a loving life and a secure future, 
but my anger and humiliation now overshadowed any affection or memories I had for her. All I wanted was revenge and for her to understand the magnitude of what she had lost. I hadn't seen Clayton in 20 years, and seeing him again brought back many happy and sad memories. He used to be my husband, and we had a good relationship until he was unfaithful, and that ended our marriage. We had a strong connection and were very close, but he wasn't as special to me as Tony was. My current husband is more attractive, a wonderful partner, and I really love him. However, I found myself with Clayton, letting him hold me and kiss me, which I knew wasn't right. I kept flirting with him even though I knew I shouldn't. I think I drank too much and was upset that Tony wasn't here with me. I should have stopped, but it felt good. Clayton still seemed like my perfect match in some ways, and I thought a little flirting was harmless. Besides, Clayton was single now, and Tony hadn't changed his plans to join me for this important wedding, so I felt I deserved some fun. After Clayton kissed me again, I felt happy inside. His kisses reminded me of old times, and I felt excited as we danced close together in a private place. I thought a little kissing and closeness was okay. Since everyone else was also enjoying the party and probably wouldn't notice us, I planned to make things right with Tony. Later. Suddenly I got a text message on my phone while all my friends were around. It could have been Tony checking up on me, and then Tony's message said he was here. I couldn't see him at first, but then I thought I saw him leaving. I panicked, realizing that I had to explain myself, but worried that he might have seen me with Clayton. In a rush of confusion, I told Clayton I needed to use the ladies' room. I rushed out of the wedding party, my heart pounding. I spotted the exit door slowly closing at the end of the hall and hurried toward it, my high heels clicking on the floor. I immediately recognized Tony, and he had seen me with Clayton. I called out to him, begging him to wait, but he didn't answer. He just got in his car and drove away. I tried to follow him, but it was too late. Now he's ignoring my calls and texts. I have sent him so many messages, but he hasn't replied to any of them. Hugh is really upset, and I can't say I don't understand why. After trying to reach him several more times, sending another 10 messages, my heart sank when I finally got a reply from him. A harsh forget you. Two of my friends found me kneeling outside in the bitter cold wondering what had gone wrong. When I told them everything, they were both shocked at what I had done and worried about what it meant for my marriage. They knew Tony well enough to know that he wouldn't let this go easily. The next morning back in Nashville at 10 a.m. M. I sat at the kitchen table and packed my things. I enjoyed one last cup of coffee in the house. We had made our home with a mixture of sadness and anger. After I finished, I left the empty cup in the sink and wrote a short note for her. In it, I instructed her not to call me and that we'd talk after the divorce papers were prepared. I didn't even sign the note. I just left my wedding ring on it as a final gesture. Before I left for the last time, I opened my laptop and divided our funds. I also canceled our joint credit card. After paying off the balance as of today, she was responsible for herself. If she contested the divorce, she would have to pay all the bills by herself. There was no way she could handle the mortgage and utilities alone. The house would sell quickly at the right price because it was in demand. If she agreed to the divorce, we could quickly end this failed marriage and she could return to her beloved client. I drove away from my former sanctuary into an unfamiliar, dark new world. I later heard from my friends at the wedding that Vera was devastated after I left. She couldn't stop crying until she finally passed out from drinking too much and exhaustion from her uncontrollable sobbing. Her friends were concerned and felt terrible for her. 
You tried to reach me several times, leaving voicemails and texts to keep her from ruining the wedding reception. They took her back to her hotel room, put her to bed, and checked on her several times throughout the night. And when she woke up the next morning and realized what had happened, she called me repeatedly begging for forgiveness and asking me to call her back. However, after witnessing her actions, I wanted nothing to do with her and ignored all of her attempts to contact me. On Sunday morning, I woke up with a severe hangover and the fear of divorce looming over me. I flew home at noon and my father picked me up at the airport. Later I found out that Tony had informed my dad that he wouldn't be able to pick me up and needed a ride himself. Judging by the worried look on my dad's face, I must have looked terrible. My dad was my source of strength, so when I saw him, I rushed over and hugged him, crying on his shoulder. Daddy? I messed up, and I think Tony left me with a sad look on his face. He gently comforted his upset daughter. I talked to him this morning, and it doesn't seem promising. You know, Tony. What were you thinking? And with Clayton, I have no idea what came over me. I was drunk and angry at Tony for not coming to the wedding. I know I made a mistake, but I need him to forgive me. Daddy? I didn't even sleep with him. Honey, from the pictures I saw, you might as well have. I'm not sure he's the forgiving type. Especially knowing Tony, and just being with another man like in those pictures was a betrayal to him. When I got home, I hoped to find Tony waiting for me, but deep down I knew he was long gone. I spent the day in tears trying to call Tony, hoping to apologize. The irony hit me hard as I realized that I had cheated on Tony with the same man who had cheated on me years before. Tony, the man I loved and cherished, seemed to have disappeared in an instant, a fact confirmed by his wedding ring left on the table with a short note. Meanwhile, I moved into the company condo meant for visiting clients, since it wasn't booked. I informed my CEO of my situation, and he approved my stay there. My boss, Bill, who's also a good friend, went through a similar situation years ago. The next day, I went up to my 16th floor office, knowing full well that Vera wouldn't be able to get past security to see me. I had already made it clear to the security team that if she tried to come in, they should politely escort her out. They did their job well, and when Vera tried to visit on Monday, she quickly realized that she wouldn't be able to see or talk to me at work. Despite her best efforts, I was determined not to have any contact with her. She was left in the dark, not knowing where I was and unable to reach me by phone, feeling isolated, regretful and fearful of what lay ahead. In the midst of this, my daughters reached out to me in panic, urging me to speak to their mother. I firmly but calmly explained to them that their mother had chosen to be with someone else and that this act was a clear betrayal to me. I made it clear how seriously I take infidelity before they could argue. I emphasized that what their mother had done amounted to cheating in my eyes. My daughters understood my position and respected my decision. I tried to help them understand that their mother's choices had consequences and that our divorce was inevitable. However, I assured them that I would always be there for them and wanted them to remain a part of my life. I also shared a lesson, hoping they would remember to always respect their future spouses and understand the seriousness of betrayal, as many wouldn't tolerate such disrespect. After I shared a post on Facebook, a lot of unexpected things happened. All my friends and family called me to find out what was going on. But something else also happened. I suddenly became very popular with women. I started dating women who were younger than me, full of energy and excitement, something I hadn't experienced much in the past few years. The constant complaints and negativity from Vera were now replaced with exciting dates, loving text messages, and attention from women who just wanted to have a good time. A month after that post, I met Cheryl, 
who later became my wife. We hit it off and became an item soon after my divorce from Vera became official. Vera wasn't happy when she found out about my new life. She was mostly angry at herself, but also jealous and upset that I didn't give her a second chance before moving on. I refused all of her attempts to see me and only communicated with her through our lawyers. We finally sold the house after paying the real estate agent and other selling costs. There wasn't much money left, less than $1,000 in equity. I decided that Vera should have that small amount. The lawyers worked hard to get a share of my future earnings, but the court decided they couldn't base the settlement on what I might earn later. Instead, they used my average income to figure out how much I should pay. Since Vera had a job, paying child support wouldn't be too difficult. In the end, I agreed to give her $2,000 a month for two years. It wasn't a huge amount, but it was enough to get her by until she could get back on her feet, or until she found someone else, which clearly wasn't going to be me. In the years that followed, Vera and I never spoke directly, only through our lawyers. She moved to Chicago where she joined a support group and eventually moved in with DR. Clayton, whom she had become close to. She wasn't the same happy person she had been with me, realizing too late the cost of her actions driven by anger and selfishness. She knew what my reaction would be, but still made a bad choice. She hadn't been intimate with Clayton that night, but she acted without regard to our marriage as if she were single again at our daughter's graduation. Three years later, Vera met my new wife, Cheryl, who was 28 and pregnant, and our one-year-old daughter, Jolene. Vera, now 47, looked much older in DR. Clayton, who came with her, stayed back, sensing the situation. Later, Vera managed to talk to me alone. She wanted to apologize, regret her actions, and the life we could have had together. She acknowledged the mistake of risking our perfect life for nothing. I told Vera that I had forgiven her, though I never expected to find her in the arms of another. I thanked her for the good times we had, our two beautiful daughters, and the love we shared. Vera's actions, as painful as they were, led me to Cheryl and a new family that helped me move past my anger. I advised her to focus on her future and assured her that our past was behind us. I wished her well and expressed my hope to see her at future family events. At that moment, Cheryl joined me with our daughter in her arms, and I took the opportunity to introduce them. The difference in their ages was obvious. Seeing Vera at 47, she could easily have been mistaken for Cheryl's mother. This realization made Vera even more sorry for the choices she had made that caused her to lose the love of her life in a single night of anger and selfishness. Over the next decade, our paths crossed again at our daughter's weddings. Vera remained unmarried, continuing her life with Clayton, who was kind to her, but seeing me with my new family and our young daughters brought back old memories of Fallen. The happy life she once had with me was now just a memory, leaving her to live out her days filled with regret for the love and happiness she had lost. In a twist of fate, after cashing in my stock options that summer, I bought back the old family home when it went back on the market. My entire family and friends, with the exception of Vera, were thrilled to have the house filled with so many of our memories back. My daughters especially enjoyed visiting and reminiscing about their childhood in that loving home. It's unfortunate that Vera chose a different path. Nevertheless, life moves on and I am enjoying building a new life and making new memories with Cheryl and our daughters. It's a lesson learned. Before you decide to do someone wrong, be sure you never need them again.